with, uh, with a projector before, and I'm still trying to work out uh, how to do it. But whilst I'm waiting for the thing to reboot, um, I'll just introduce myself quickly. Um, I'm Chris Davenport, and uh, I uh, work in the, um, for a small company in, in Bridge North in rural Shropshire uh, called Clicking Mad. And uh, we do web design and development. Uh, but also in my spare time, what there is of it, uh, I'm on the Juma leadership team, and I'm in the production working group, and I'm, I have particular responsibility for Joomla's documentation. And uh, let's see if this will just recognize my mouse. Anyone know how to configure uh, alternative displays on Linux? <laughs> My last laptop, you just plugged it in and it just worked, but this one is not doing it for some reason. Yeah, I'm in the... It, key in combination with screen key. You're in blue? Oh, uh, wait a moment. Do, 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 do. Hey, boy, FH, but in combination with function key, it should give us a... That, that, screen, that should give us a picture. <laughs> hey, fuck it. There we go. Hey. Brilliant. Well done. Well done. There we go. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. Let's try this again. Where have we got to? Let's see, let's see if this mouse will start working. There we go. Right, hopefully that uh, should work now. Got the wrong resolution, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see if we can adjust this. So, 800 by 600, you reckon? Yes, you're very, very. Come on, abandon that. So, what uh, what settings do you reckon? Uh, uh, you want a higher resolution? Try 1125. 1024, you reckon? Um, That's not enough, is it? Let's try. Sorry about this, guys. If I did this all the time, it would be an expert. Okay, let's try that. Oh, well, that's, that's interesting. Okay. Let's go even higher then, shall we? Let's just see if that is. Uh, whatever it was. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, having no idea what the um, resolution is. There. Okay, that's that's about as good as it's going to get, I think, actually.
I, we'll have to. <laughs> we'll manage. <laughs> or you can all gather around my laptop. It's a, you know, you? Disappear. Please disappear. <laughs> I'll carry on anyway. Yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> right, okay, so a brief introduction. Uh, gone through that, so I'll get straight on because we're running out of time now. Uh, this, is about, uh, this talk is about template tuning. Um, particularly, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, how to make Joomla websites faster. So I'm not really going to talk about uh, PHP or SQL optimization. That's an entirely different topic, and there isn't time to, to cover those anyway. So uh, that's a quick overview of, of what I'm going to talk about. There's a couple of items you can't see down there, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm going to look at some the tools that you could use to help you uh, make um, Joomla sites run faster. Uh, and the main topic really is about JavaScript because that's generally the biggest problem on, um, on performance. And then there's a couple of other things that can be optimized as well, CSS, images, and I'll finish off with a, um, uh, an overview of how you might actually go through an optimization process on a, on a, on a Joomla site. Um, but I suppose we first should ask the question, does it really matter if, if the site is running fast? Um, there's actually some uh, work that's been done by uh, Google and Amazon. These, these figures are very often quoted on the, on the internet. You'll see them all over the place. They did some research on, um, on performance on their sites. And Google, for example, found that uh, a 500 millisecond delay, which is half a second delay in, uh, in serving web pages uh, on their site, resulted in a 20% drop in traffic, which is uh, you know, a big effect for such a small amount of delay. Uh, and Amazon similarly uh, found that for every 100 milliseconds of delay on their site, it resulted in a 1% drop in sales. <coughs> so performance does matter. Um, and recently, you may have seen this blog post from Google. Um, from, from now on, basically, they're going to start taking uh, the speed of websites into account when they uh, rank uh, websites. At the moment, they're, all they're doing is, is downgrading the, the very worst performing sites rather than looking at the upgrading the highest performers, but uh, it's perhaps just a matter of time before they start doing that as well. So performance is, is important. Um, whether you're running even a small site or a big site, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you need, to, need it to run fairly quickly. Um, but what tools should you use? Um, well, I hope everybody's using Fire, Firefox, and uh, you've, you've heard of and probably used the Firebug extension. Um, Firebug has a, a panel in there called the, the Net Panel, uh, which gives you an awful, an awful lot of information about uh, uh, what's going on, about requests that are being made by the browser. So that's uh, probably the major tool in, in, the, in the arsenal. There's also a very useful little uh, add-on for Firebug called YSlow which uh, just appears off the bottom of the screen there, um, which analyzes the, uh, the web page, um, but also gives you some very, very useful advice on what you can do to make it run faster. And uh, the, tr the trouble with YSlow and uh, Google do another one called Page Search, which is very similar, is that they're not Joomla specific. So I'm, I'm really going to go through some of the things, some of their advice, basically, but in a Joomla specific way. And then finally, there's um, a little tool called Wireshark, which I use occasionally. Um, not very often. It's actually a packet sniffer, so you can actually see exactly what's going down the wire with the timing of those events as well. So very occasionally, I, I, will, I will use that to, uh, to see uh, exactly what's happening on the, on the connection. So here's a typical uh, website. Um, and unfortunately, the bit you need to see is actually off the bottom. Um, but it's actually just the net um, panel there with uh, the um, showing you the, the timeline. And I'll skip quickly onto the next one because I think, uh, no, it's the one after it. Uh, and the YSlow looks a bit like this. You've perhaps seen it before. It uh, analyzes the site, gives you a summary, but it also breaks it down into individual headings, individual rules, and grades the site on those particular individual rules. So you can see um, which, uh, which areas you need to give attention to. And uh, this is 
the sort of output that you get from the net panel in, uh, in um, Firebug. Uh, how, many have, how many people have actually seen this, this sort of thing before? The, the net plumbing? Yeah, most of you, okay, right. Um, this, I thought it'd be fun actually to, to actually look at the, the J and Beyond website. So this actually is the, um, the performance of uh, the J and Beyond website. Um, and it has this uh, fairly typical uh, staircase effect in it. Ideally for a fast website, you want all of those things lining up in a nice vertical col column so everything's happening in parallel. But here we see that we're getting this staircase effect here. Uh, that's no criticism of J and Beyond website, incidentally. Uh, probably 90% of Joomla websites look like that. The interesting thing, though, is that the, the first request here, this top line here, is where um, Joomla is, has been asked to process the index.php and deliver the HTML back. And in fact, that only occupies roughly 20% of the entire page load time. And that is the only time in which Joomla is actually involved. The rest of the time, you're just downloading files, They're static resources that are being downloaded for 80% of the time. So optimizing the code in Joomla, you know, knocking five milliseconds off here, on, or optimizing SQL statements, you're actually only optimizing the 20% of that page load time. 80% of the time is down to just downloading static resources. Um, but we can improve on that 80% by making modifications to the template to optimize the, the order in particular of, of uh, how that information is downloaded. So I'll uh, quickly run through what a, what a single request to a server actually looks like. Um, you probably know most of this already, but initially you'll, uh, you'll need to know where, the, the, the browser needs to know where uh, the resource actually is and it has a web address like Joomla.org. So it makes a, uh, an inquiry on a DNS server. The DNS server tells it what the IP address is. The browser can then open a TCP connection to uh, the actual web server. So this is the, the server at Joomla.org. Um, having opened that connection, which takes a little bit of time, it then requests the resource. Um, and then the, the server, which you can't see, responds back with the, with the reply. And eventually, the, uh, it will close that connection again. Uh, and overall, that, that's, that process is a little bit inefficient. So browsers optimize this by doing a few things. For a start, they cache DNS queries. So you only ever do uh, one DNS query for a particular domain. After that, it uses the same address. It assumes that it's not going to change in between. It's a pretty good assumption. Uh, and the other thing that... Um, uh, browsers and servers do is that they reuse connections so they don't open and close connections continuously. Uh, having opened a connection to a server, it reuses it after it's uh, requested a single resource, gets more resources from the same connection. So the opening and closing of connections is uh, reduced as well. So given that, the, the, this, uh, these efficiencies take place, why do we get this staircase effect? The biggest problem um, is actually down to JavaScript and the way that browsers in particular handle JavaScript. Um, and again, let's have a look at the, uh, the J and Beyond site. It's a fairly typical um, situation here. And you can see here that there's, uh, I think, five JavaScript files being requested. And the problem here is that it's actually sandwiched in between some CSS files at the top and some CSS at the bottom. And what happens with the JavaScript is basically everything stops while the JavaScript is downloaded. So this CSS here is not being downloaded, it doesn't start being requested even until that JavaScript has been processed. So it's actually worse than that. Um, there are maximum connections allowed between browsers or well, not necessarily allowed, but certainly there are limits on, that browsers impose on the number of connections to a particular domain or a particular host. Uh, this is actually a comparison of different browsers, mostly current browsers, um, showing the number of connections that, are, that it will make to a particular host name. And most current browsers will, will uh, support six connections simultane simultaneously. 
um, which means basically you're downloading, say, six images at the same time, or six JavaScripts or six CSS. Uh, if a seventh one needs to be downloaded, then it has to wait for one of the earlier ones to finish downloading before it will start that request. Older browsers, it's much worse. If you look at IE7 there, IE7 will actually only open two connections to any given host name at any one time. And IE6 people will, uh, uh, will know that actually that IE7 is the same, so uh, th that only opens two requests as well. Maximum connections overall for the entire web page um, has also increased in the more modern browsers. 30 was fairly typical a while back, 60 is more like it. Uh, some of the browsers may actually take more than 60. This actually survey only, go, uh, go, uh, only goes up to a maximum of 60 anyway. So if, you're, if you've got a web page which is really, really complicated and has more than 60 images on it, for example, then you would expect that to hit performance problems. Um, so it's a good idea to not have that many images on a single page. If that wasn't enough, though, it's even worse than that for JavaScript in particular because um, JavaScript is handled very, in a very special way by the browsers. They have to pass and execute the JavaScript. And the trouble with JavaScript is that it, it is capable of making changes to the DOM on the fly. So it has to be done in a certain way so that within the browser so that it doesn't mess up the display. Um, and what happens on older browsers in particular, IE7 here, for example, stands out. If you're downloading one piece of JavaScript, then it will not download another piece of JavaScript at the same time. This is unlike images, where it will be quite happy to download two or three images at the same time. With JavaScript, it blocks completely. only downloads one at a time and executes it. Uh, it's not just downloading. It has to actually execute it as well before it will download the next one. Uh, and similarly, uh, downloading a, a script uh, at the same time as a style sheet will also block in IE7. So uh, IE6, IE7 basically only does one thing at a time when there's a JavaScript coming down. More modern browsers are a bit better at it. They will do things more simultaneously. So you need to be aware that older browsers actually have lower limits. Not everybody is browsing with current browsers anyway. Um, and by way of illustration of that, uh, this, is, this is what um, a fairly typical Joomla site looked like about six months ago with an old browser. Um, I think it was an earlier version of Firefox. Because it's not just Internet Explorer that had these limits, it's Firefox, earlier versions of Firefox did as well. So this is the sort of thing that it looks like. As soon as you get a piece of JavaScript, everything stops. Everything stops again for the next piece of JavaScript. It then gets a load of CSS, which it's happy to do in parallel. Then it hits another piece of JavaScript and everything stops. Uh, so that's how you get this staircase effect. Um, on the Joomla.org domain, uh, I looked uh, earlier on in the week, and uh, the number of people browsing that domain with uh, early versions of Internet Explorer and Firefox is a little over 25%. And now the chances are that a, a non-open source website, a commercial website, is probably going to get a higher proportion of older browsers hitting it, because I would expect the number of people uh, looking at Joomla.org probably tend to keep their browsers up to date. So what do we do about it? Well, the thing to do about it is you should move the JavaScript to the end of the template. Most people put it in the head. That's where it tends to go. Um, but you need to move the JavaScript down towards the end of the template just before that end, end body tag. And uh, this is, I, I tried to get an illustration of just what happens when you do that, and it's not going to show up here because you can't see the, this is the before picture where there's one piece of JavaScript there, uh, and then after it, it moves and it just improves the performance. Not very much in this particular case because it's a tiny piece of JavaScript. It's only 1K in actual fact, but uh, it, it, there is an effect. You'll have to take my word for it on that one. <laughs> okay, it's all really very well me saying move the JavaScript to the end, but how do you actually do it? Well, if, uh, if your JavaScript calls are just in script tags, then it's actually quite simple. You just cut and paste them from one place to the other. Um, but uh, components and modules can also insert JavaScript into, into the head using Joomla API calls. So what do you do about those? 
Well, you can actually manipulate the, uh, the head data in the template on the fly and just move stuff down that way. Um, and this is a bit of code that does that. Uh, I'll put this entire presentation on uh, SlideShare after the event anyway, so if you want to download it, it's, uh, that's fine. Um, so what it does is it use, does a quick API call just to get all the head data. You put this, uh, this code incidentally at the end of the, of the template just before the closing body tag. Um, you get the head data. Uh, there's actually a quicker way to doing that because you can use dollar this rather than, but I did it longhand so that you can just see what uh, makes it a bit more obvious what it's doing. So you get the document, you get the head data from the document. And you then move all the external scripts to the head. Basically all you're doing here is just outputting the script tags that would normally go into the head, but you're outputting at the, at the tail of the template instead. And that bit of code does that. You then move the internal scripts uh, down to the end as well. Um, but you can't see that underneath is basically it just clears out the arrays in the head data. So dollar head, set, them, set the, uh, the, the scripts and script um, arrays in there to empty arrays. And that stops uh, the JDoc include type equals head from rendering those scripts. Otherwise, you'd get them twice. You'd get them once in the head, once in the tail. So you just get rid of those out of the head. And that's basically how you do that. While you're on the job, though, you can do something else. Who used MooTools? Is that, do you, anybody use MooTools? What about other libraries? Do you use jQuery? Yeah, any other libraries other than that? No? This is a fairly even mix of people using different tools there. Uh, for, for most of those libraries, you can actually download them. Instead of downloading them off your own server, get them off Google because uh, Google servers generally tend to run faster than yours. Moving all the white space and the comments out of it. Um, you can also shorten um, variable names, so developers will often use quite long descriptive names for variables. The computer doesn't care what the name of the variable is, so you can shorten it down to A or B or something. Really, really short. And there are automatic scripts available to actually do this minification for you, so you haven't got to worry about it. And the one that uh, you can use uh, is on the YSlow. Um, site is automatically linked by Yslow. So if you click that all JS minified there, it will go through all the JavaScript on, the web, on that particular web page and return the minified versions of uh, that JavaScript for you, which you can then cut and paste into your, in, uh, into your local files. Be careful, of course, not to overwrite the originals, because uh, you'll probably want to go back and change those at some point. Um, the alternative, which, which I tend to use and I quite like, is uh, to use the Minify script itself and actually put it within Joomla so that it's, it's used automatically by Joomla. Uh, and the way you do, to do that is to uh, go to Google's uh, code site there, download the Minify zip file, uh, and unload it into your template, template root directory. So here, if you have a template called J and Beyond, just uh, un unpack it into that directory, and you will get this. Uh, file structure here with a, uh, with a min folder with all the code in it. Uh, you then have to go into the config.php file, which is there, and just amend the paths so that it knows where to find things. It's actually very well commented, so it's, it's, it's very easy to set up. And there's just a couple of settings that you'll need to tweak there so that uh, it knows where these various files are. And then you have to set up groups, which unfortunately has disappeared off the screen there. Um, so what you do is you, you, you have a group of, of JavaScript files uh, that you want to be minified. Uh, and you give that group a name, which in this particular case I've called JS. And it's just a list of files, basically, in an array. Uh, and those, are the f those files will then be not only minified, but also merged together. So you'll actually just get one JavaScript file out at the end. And uh, as we saw earlier, having one JavaScript file, only one JavaScript file, is really, really good, because having two at the same time has severe performance problems. And then you've got to modify the template. Uh, and to do that, you add a couple of lines of extra code. First of all, you, uh, you load the Minify script. Um, and then you call the Minify script with the name of the group that you want. And that uh, generates a unique um, URI for that, uh, that Minified JavaScript file. And then at the bottom of the template, which you can't quite see here, 
you actually insert the script tag which points to this URI. So this URI that was generated here is just inserted into a script tag at the end of the template. Uh, and just by way of illustration, I've just commented out the five original JavaScript files to show that it's been replaced by that. In practice, of course, you wouldn't leave them commented out, you just delete them. So you're replacing those five with one. It's down there. Uh, as an added bonus, uh, Minify, the Minify script also sets uh, far future inf expiry dates on the, uh, on, the, on the headers for that uh, JavaScript file. So, because if effectively you're not serving a static resource as far as uh, uh, the system is concerned, it's, you're calling a PHP file which generates the JavaScript for you. Uh, it only does it once, of course, because it's all cached. Um, but it also, at the same time, sets far future expiry dates, which means that the browser knows that uh, uh, this JavaScript is not going to change, so it doesn't bother requesting it again. And it also works, of course, for all the uh, uh, web cache servers that might be sitting in between your browser or the, the customer's browser and the, and the website. Um, so let's have a look at uh, CSS. Um, in actual fact, there's, there's a lot less to say about CSS because it's a lot easier to deal with than JavaScript. Uh, you should, of course, have all the CSS in the head, which you should anyway, really. Uh, but that is the best place for it from, performance, from a performance perspective. Um, you should try and re remove all unnecessary CSS rules. Um, obviously, every bit of uh, bandwidth is important. So if you've got lots of CSS rules which are not being used, then make sure you remove them from the file. It causes delays otherwise. <coughs> Not huge ones, but you know, every little helps. And you should also uh, merge, minify, and compress CSS files in the same way that uh, you, you do for JavaScript. Um, and in fact, YSlow will uh, provide the links for you to do that as well. It just so happens, though, that the minify script that I showed you earlier um, applied to JavaScript also works with CSS. You just need to set up a separate group of CSS files um, and point minify at it and it, and it, and it just works. Um, and the other thing you should look at, uh, can't see it there, is to, is to consider using a content delivery network. Um, this is really mainly for high traffic sites, but uh, anyway, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, you can't quite see it here. Uh, it, there is an option on the Y slow menu uh, for uh, compressing, uh, compressing CSS. Let's have a look at images. Um, if you have any l really large images on a page um, that you can't break down into smaller images, which is sometimes a, a good technique, um, you should try and starting them early. Um, either have them higher up in the index.php, which of course you may or not, may not be able to do, but if they're background images in CSS, then move the rule up towards the, the top of the file because the file is pro processed sequentially. Um, uh, or if you've got multiple files, then put it into an earlier file. Obviously, you have to watch the cascade. But uh, if you can move it physically up towards the top of the file, then it gets, that, gets the browser to request it earlier. Uh, because a large image is going to take longer to download, the earlier you can get it started, the better, because it can do other things in parallel. It can download other images in parallel with that big image. As with everything else, merge and compress image files. And I'll say a bit more about that in, the few, in, a, in a second. Um, and you should try and serve, Im if possible, you can try and serve images from a cookie-free domain. Um, browsers send cookies out with everything. Um, if you, typically, a, a Joomla site, um, the images will be served from uh, the images directory on the, on, the, on the same Joomla site that uh, all your HTML is coming from. And because Joomla requires cookies, it sends cookies when it requests these images. Uh, the server's going to ignore the cookies. They're, they're meaningless to the, to, as far as images are concerned, so it throws them away. Um, but typically, you're sending about 1K of cookie data with every request for every image. So ideally, you want to try and set up a domain which will serve the images. Uh, but if you've never, ever used cookies on that domain, then um, the browser will not send any cookies to it. So it'll save that, that, um, that bandwidth. Um, 
if you set it up carefully, you can actually use a subdomain in, uh, under your main domain. So if, you're, if you've got uh, www.domain.com as your main domain, you could set up something like images.domain.com uh, and serve images from there. And if, as long as the only thing you ever serve from that subdomain is, is images or static resources, so you could use JavaScript and CSS from there as well, then the browser won't send any cookies to it. And the other thing is, is again, to, to look at possibility of using content delivery networks, which I'll come to in just a second. Um, unfortunately, you can't see this bit. Um, there's a, a classic example of merging um, images into a single image, which is to use this, the sprite technique. And Google is, is, has done this extremely well on, on its home page. And um, if you actually use the uh, net panel on, on Google's home page, you'll find that it's actually only down, it's, it's downloading two images on that home page. The first one is this, for this logo here. The second one is a, is a sprite, which contains, well, it's actually 167 by 222 pixels, and it contains about a couple of dozen images, which are actually not used on that page. They're actually used on subsequent pages. Um, but that's a very fast download, very efficient download, and it's preloading the image. So you don't need it on that page, but you need it on following pages. It's used some of the bandwidth it took to load that page to make subsequent pages run faster. And that's a good technique to use. If you, if you, specifically, if you, if you have landing pages on your site, um, you can actually use a little bit of bandwidth on those landing pages to make the rest of the site work faster by preloading static resources. How do you generate sprites? sprites? Uh, well, there are actually lots of online tools to do this for you. Uh, this is one I happen to use. Uh, what you do is you create a zip file containing all the images that you want. Uh, and just upload it to that site, and it returns one image back to you, plus all the CSS rules that you need to access the individual images. And it, and it just names them fairly sensibly, so that the name of the, of the CSS rule was the name of the image that you uploaded with a little prefix on it. Uh, and that just simplifies the whole process. You then obviously just cut and paste from, from there into your CSS to access the individual images. Uh, the reason I happen to use this one is, uh, is it's open source, it's written in PHP. And if I ever wanted to, I don't normally, but if I ever wanted to, I could run it locally. I could put it on my own server and run it. Um, and uh, the, the next thing you should do with images is, is crush them. Um, although images, by their very nature, are, uh, contain compressed data anyway, it is possible to compress them a bit more by removing redundant information because a lot of images contain uh, empty headers, they contain EXIF data, they contain all sorts of rubbish there that they don't actually need to contain. Uh, and there is an online tool called Smushit which uh, removes this data um, and you can actually get to it from the YSLO menu. And what you do is you um, point uh, Smushit at your web page it runs through all the images that are on that page and creates a zip file with all these compressed, these, these smushed images. It's quite fun to watch it doing it. It's a little bit of uh, Ajax actually keeps this clocking up as it's processing. But, uh, and that's fairly typical. You can get maybe 10% reduction in, in the size of all the images on the, on the site just by, by running that. So then you download that zip file containing all your images, upload it onto your server, overwrite all the original images and you're done. Sorry? Smash it. It's just the service use. Yes, it's an online service. It's free. Um, I think there are, the limitations on it are that uh, you can only do so many per day or something like that. But you know, I've, I've thrown considerable quantities at it in the past, and it's, it hasn't complained. Um, on, on, on Smash it, one of the guys in, the, in our office uses it a lot. Uh, I haven't actually myself, but that zip file you download, does it have the folder structure? Yes. Well, there, there is actually a, an option there. You click it. To, to either keep the folder structure as it is or, or to discard the folder structure. It's up to you. Uh, you can actually do it for individual images as well if you want to do it that way. I used it for that day, but I didn't know you could Yeah, yeah, you can. <coughs> I mentioned a couple of times uh, content delivery networks. Um, the idea with that is that 
you can improve the response times by making sure that the content that is on your web page is geographically near to the web visitor, the web surfer. surfer. So uh, just by way of illustration of that, I, I pinged a couple of sites here to see what the difference in response time is. The top one is the bbc.co.uk website, and since I'm from England, that's, uh, that's local to me, and you're typically getting a response time to those pings of about 40 milliseconds. But if I ping Joomla.org site, which is uh, located in America, in Atlanta, uh, that server responds in a bit under 160 milliseconds. So that's four times the, uh, the response time there. So ideally, you want to try and serve your content from a geographically local area to your site visitor. But of course, your site visitor could be anywhere in the world. Um, so there are mostly commercial, but there are services called content delivery networks where you can upload your content. It's distributed to various servers around the planet, and it will serve automatically uh, the content that, on, on your web page from the nearest, uh, or at least the fastest, um, server that is available. Um, as I said, these, most of the CDN services are actually commercial. Um, you have to pay for them. So generally, you'll probably only do it for high traffic websites. Uh, there's um, services like Akamai, uh, Rockin also provide a CDN. In actual fact, uh, the Joomla.org homepage, if you, or well, that, that site generally, if you look at the template, you'll see that uh, a lot of the images, um, instead of being served from www.joomla.org, they're served from cdn.joomla.org. And that's because they're being served from Rockin's content delivery network. Uh, there are, uh, well, there's certainly at least one free CDN of, uh, service available. Uh, if you look up Coral CDN, uh, that's, uh, that works. It improves, it actually when improves, maybe work well? It certainly improves performance, yes. Um, I mean, certainly on a, on a high traffic site like Joomla.org, where you're getting you know, 25 million visitors a month, um, it makes a considerable difference. I, I mean, specifically the Coral. Oh, sorry, the Coral one. Um, it, it makes a difference, but whether you'd know, I mean, you're talking about milliseconds rather than, you know, huge amounts of difference. But I've never actually thrown a high volume site at Coral CDN. So. Um, I thought I'd finish off actually just by uh, running through um, a suggested process for, for optimizing a site. Um, because it's all very well having all these different optimization techniques, um, but when do you use them? Because obviously, uh, if you um, uh, minify and merge all your JavaScript, and then, then during the development process find that you need to make a change to it, then you've got a more complicated process to go through because you've got to uh, then re-merge, re re-minify everything again. So uh, when, when do you do these various different things? So the first thing is, during the process of developing a site, you should ideally at all times keep the CSS in the head and the JavaScript in the end. There are going to be occasions, and they are actually quite rare, where you can't put the JavaScript at the end of the template. Um, the, the classic one is if you've got JavaScript containing document.write, because document.write statements have to be where they are because they're changing the DOM at that point. Uh, so you can't generally move those to the tail. But um, virtually everything else can be moved. So the idea is if you move it during the development process, then you're not going to be hit by any surprises at the end. You'll, if there are any problems with, with having the JavaScript in that position, you'll find them early, and you'll be able to fix them. If you need to move the JavaScript up to the top, then, then do so. Otherwise, fix the problem and, uh, and leave it at the end. Um, but then everything else, all the other optimization, really can be left to the final stages of the site build. So basically, before you're delivering the site, almost as a, one of the last things you do is, is you can go through these optimization techniques. So in, in order, um, what I would tend to do is uh, create the sprite images first. Uh, and then obviously, you have to update the CSS rules. Uh, and test it to make sure that you actually did it right. The images are still actually visible. Um, you can then crush the images, bearing in mind that some of those have been spritified, 
So you want to crush them after you've generated the sprites. Um, and then you should minify and compress the CSS because at, presumably at that point you uh, uh, don't need to change it anymore, <coughs> so it's, it's quite safe to go ahead and minimize it. Uh, and obviously you'll need to just update the uh, template index.php and retest at that point. Uh, you can't see it there, but the next one says minify and compress JavaScript, so you'd repeat the process for, for the JavaScript minification and update your template and test again. And then after the site has gone live, uh, a very important step, really. The way that, uh, probably the best way of doing it involves configuring the server to compress the stuff on the fly. Um, the problem is it's dynamic. It's changing every time. Every page is different. So you can't necessarily have a static cache uh, serving that stuff. So you have to, do the, you have to recompute it each time. So, but it, you, if you change the server configuration so that it, it gazips everything coming out on the fly, then that will work. Um, because really, white space, if you, if you zip it down, is, uh, you know, it disappears anyway. It compresses extremely well. But you, that's not something you can do within Joomla, which is why I didn't mention it. You know, I'm, I'm, I was focusing on Joomla stuff. Uh, that, that involves having tweaked servers. Uh, and the vast majority of people probably wouldn't know how to do it, uh, let alone they probably don't even have access to do it. So. Yes? In the start, when you were talking about closing the cache for the opening and opening process in Joomla. Uh, the uh, connections. The, the connections, yes. Yeah. Uh, are there any times when this could cause some pro problem? It, it's, it happens, it was just a matter of information, really. It happens transparently in the background. Uh, you, you would never see it. You'd never be aware of these things happening. Um, it, it's part of the, of, of the protocol, the HTTP protocol and TCP protocols that are used, that this happens automatically for you. You don't have any control over it. <laughs> yep? Uh, is, the difference, uh, between the, uh, is there a speed difference in using uh, color codes like uh, hexadecimal or RGB codes? In the CSS rules? Yeah. Um, well, ideally, keep them as short as possible. So short but, uh, yeah, but uh, I would think you're talking about nanoseconds <laughs> in, in performance differences, really, on that. Yeah. We've tried out a few of the um, Joomla extensions to sort of automate some of yep. the process. And probably 95% of the time we've tried them, you switch it on and it just destroys everything. Yep. So we've then gone through and just done some manual processes instead. Yep. We figured that would be quicker than looking at what these automated processes are doing. What are your experiences with those? Do you have any luck with that or do you just do uh, everything manually? I've, I've not used the, uh, the plugins that you're referring to. Um, but not because they don't work. Um, in fact, the one or two occasions when I've looked at them, they, they have worked fine. Uh, the reason I don't use them is because they're not as fast as doing uh, either doing it manually or using that Minify script. The Minify script doesn't use Joomla to process those things, so it can execute very, very quickly. Um, whereas the plugin is uh, basically what it does is it, um, it looks at the output that Joomla generates, uh, basically the HTML that it generates. It passes that, runs a regular expression over it, finds all the JavaScript or CSS rules in it, and replaces those things with the minified versions on the fly. Now that's actually a lot of processing that it's doing there to do that. Um, so I think calling the minify script directly and having the stuff cached is going to be a lot more efficient. And that's the only reason I don't use them. Um, but it, it's interesting if you say that it don't even work <laughs> on occasions. <laughs> I hadn't experienced that, but that's, uh, yeah. We have speed test customers who experience exactly that. We run the Minify script from, uh, from Google, and we try one of the extensions of the plugin, and the Minify script was faster. Yeah. It's clearly faster. It's not Yes, Peter. Uh, yeah, you, you said something about uh, putting images uh, at separate domains, like a subdomain. Yep. Uh, if you keep your images on your own domain uh, and create a subdomain, which redirects to, the, to a certain image directory, uh, will it still use cookies? Uh, if, you, if you set it up right, I, I think you're OK. <laughs> uh, if, if you've got to redirect, um, like most people redirect domain.com to www.domain.com, uh, then if you then set up an images.domain.com, then I think you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, the only way to be sure is to actually see what goes down the wire. And uh, you can use the, uh, the net panel in, um, in Firebug. 
uh, to actually see what the server's actually sent, uh, what, the, what the browser's actually sent to the, to the server to make sure that you, you're definitely not sending cookies to it. Yep. Um, obviously, a lot of the stuff you talked about today is for the developers and for optimizing the templates. Um, once you hand over a site to a client and they start uploading images, offering straight off their camera and showing their scenes, yeah. so you can upload it this big and it'll crush it down to this and make a thumbnail for you and that's great. Yeah. Are there any ways that you can, is there, I don't know, an API that would smush it or whatever so that the images when the client uploads it are compressed nicely as well? Um, I, I have seen um, bits of PHP around the internet that you can look for which does that sort of thing. So that instead of serving static images, it's, it, it gives you a, a reference to a, a PHP script, and you just, it's just not, the image name is then an argument on that PHP script, and it will do it on the fly. Obviously, it caches it, so it only does it once. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good idea generally, especially if you've got badly behaved clients that do that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Right, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. There's also a content optimizer plugin, I'm not sure what it's called, that um, once you load the images on, on the server, it then resizes and reads them and well, compresses them. And right. It creates them in a separate directory, like a directory. Yeah. And renames the images, so you do probably SEO that, but the, the images would, would be much smaller. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the sort of thing that I've seen uh, around as well. There are various different scripts if you go hunting for them that will do that sort of thing. You probably find that one that matches your requirements, or you can just hack the code a bit to, to make it do what you want. Okay, thank you.